Up next, Gordon and I take a look at the Canon EOS R or EOS R on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Hi, it's Doug Kay here with Mr. Camera Labs Gordon Lang to take a look at a new camera from Canon. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Doug. How are you? Um, I'm doing great here. It's good to be back. It is good to have you back. It's great to have you back. In fact, I've had so many comments saying, where's Doug? Bring Doug back. So here he is for you in person. Are you feeling 100% operational and firing on all thrusters? I, I am good enough. <laughs> good I'm, enough. I'm a, that's, that's all I aim for these days. And I'm 100% today because I'm on my second cup of coffee. Nice one. Me too. So we're in the, in the just about the same place. Okay, the Canon EOS R. This is uh, Canon's, you probably heard of it. It's uh, Canon's first full frame mirrorless camera. And a camera I would say that anticipation has been pretty, you know, pretty high on, you know, people have been discussing this for quite a long time. Will they ever do it? Well, of course they've done it. So uh, before we go any further, Doug, how much does the EOS R cost? In the US, this camera is $2290, let us call it $2300 body only, or for another 1100 you can get it with the kit 24 to 105 so that's $3,400 here in the U.S. Okay, I'll just jump in there and say that in the U.K., the body is uh, 2349 pounds um, or about 3250 pounds if you also have the 24 to 105 and the EF lens adapter we're going to talk much more about later on. But let's compare it to some other things to put it in, you know, let's have some sort of uh, figures to compare it to. Most obviously, Sony's A7 Mark III. How much does that cost, Doug? Yeah, the A7 Mark III is actually uh, $300 cheaper, $2,000 roughly here in the U.S. Or with their kit lens, which is 28 to 70, uh, $2,200. So um, this camera, especially with the kit lens, is quite a bit more. Now that that's a little apples to oranges because the kit lenses are not the same for sure. But um, no, but it's but anyway, the basic the basic camera is three hundred dollars more than the a seven Mark three, which is quite the benchmark to beat. Yeah. And I, I mean, we might as well just get this out of the way. You know, the elephant in the room, not me this time. The elephant in the room this time is that the a seven three does out specify the EOS R in almost every respect. Um, there are some respects that the Canon does beat it on that I'll, I'll talk about later. But, you know, if you're looking at specifications alone, the a7 III is, is an absolutely outstanding camera. So we'll, we'll just say that right now. Now there's a third uh, mirrorless full frame camera that is out right now, which is the uh, Nikon Z6 and Z7. I'm gonna call them Z because I'm from the UK. Uh, Doug, of course you call them the Z. So how much in America is uh, the Z6 and Z7? I'm, I'm developing a stutter, Gordon. I'm starting to refer to them as Z myself. The Z6 is $2,000, so $300 less than this camera. But the Z7 or Z7 is quite a pricey camera. That's $3,400, which is what? Let's see, $1,100 roughly more than this uh, EOS R. So it's... Um, well, it's, that's another show to talk about the six and the seven. Yeah, I think I think because I was going to say let's do, let's do the Sony A7 uh, R Mark III as well, but n maybe not. I think the three that are kind of comparable, the three full frame mirrorless cameras that are roughly in the same ballpark are the Sony A7 III, the Nikon Z7, sorry Z6 or Z6, and uh, the EOS R. And of course, there's a, there's another full frame mirrorless that's coming into the mix in early 2019 uh, from Panasonic. Their new relationship with uh, Sigma and Leica. Sigma will of course also have their own they all share the the Leica uh, mount so it's it's suddenly gone Sony's gone from being the only company with a consumer full frame mirrorless camera to to one of four or more uh, which so suddenly this market has become very very busy there's obviously demand for these kind of cameras so um, let's Let's talk about image quality first of all, because this is quite an easy one to cover. Now, Canon are always a bit kind of discreet. Well, not discreet. They're always, they kind of try and avoid the question a bit. And you say, look, you know, the specification of this sensor looks very similar to a previous sensor that you used. Is it the same? They go, oh, no, no, no. It's not the same. It's different in a way that we can't tell you. So with that in mind, I'm pretty sure that the EOS R uses the EOS 5D Mark IV sensor. And at this point, Doug, do you have a price for the EOS 5D Mark IV? Yeah, that's interesting because that's still a player, obviously. That's, let's call it $3,100 here in the U.S. or 4000 with, a, a, again, a 24 to 105 kit lens. So uh, let's say it's uh, $700 more. What am I looking? No, wrong thing here. Six, yeah, $700 more than this camera. So the EOS 5D Mark IV, so while we go through this discussion, you know, um, the EOS R is basically delivering EOS 5D Mark IV 
image quality, if perhaps not some of the other features, for a considerably lower price. So if you've always looked at the EOS 5D Mark IV and gone, if only I could have that in a mirrorless format at a cheaper price, then the ESR is already for you. Stop watching this and uh, go out and buy one and, uh, you know, thank, thank, me, thank us in the comments for saving you a lot of time and effort. If only the decision were that simple. <laughs> Well, it could be that simple. And I mean, you know, to not spoil the ending, it, that is actually one of the decisions that you could come to if you're if you're considering this camera. But um, so we're pretty sure it's got the same sensor. That gives it a 30 ish me megapixel full frame sensor. The image quality looks very, very, very similar It's using a newer image processor. So that does give it some benefits. Now, when I looked at the JPEG straight out camera from the EOS 5D Mark IV, it had a lot of the characteristics of some other Canon DSLRs before it, which is that the, the color science is very nice, but I've, I always felt they were a little bit kind of lacking the punchiness of some other cameras. Uh, but I found that with the EOS R, they've kind of, they've gone for that more kind of consumer friendly, punchy output. Not, not overkill by any means. I would say they've got the balance just about right. I was very, very pleased with the with the JPEGs out of camera from the OSR, and I've got loads of samples at CameraLabs.com if you want to download those full resolution originals and check them out for yourself. So in terms of image quality, pretty much the same as the EOS uh, 5D Mark IV, except to my eyes, a little bit more contrasty and a little bit sharper as well. So very satisfying. In terms of like the overall experience, you, it would be very easy for us to just say, hey, you know, imagine the EOS 5D Mark IV in live view, you know, basically not using its mirror, and that's what you've got with the EOS R. Uh, and it kind of roughly speaking, that would be the case. But again, time has moved on. It's a couple of years since the 5D Mark IV. The focusing is definitely a little bit faster than the 5D Mark IV in live view, but it's a similar sort of experience. So if you're coming from a DSLR, you're gonna enjoy the fact that you can autofocus anywhere in the frame. You're gonna be able to deploy face detection anywhere in the frame. Uh, the Canon, uh, sorry, the camera's metering system can, can look at data from the entire imaging sensor. You know, these are some of the benefits of going for a mirrorless camera over a, an optical uh, viewfinder based DSLR. The other thing is that when you're using an electronic viewfinder, you can do things like playback images uh, through the viewfinder, which is great on a sunny day. You can film movies and playback movies. You can use all manner of focusing assistants. Now, Doug and I talk about this stuff all the time. We've been using mirrorless cameras for years, and a lot of you are also very familiar with mirrorless cameras. You'd be going, Shaha, yeah, right, you know, all mirrorless cameras do that. But you'd be surprised how many, especially Canon owners that I've spoken to while testing the ESR, who are still very much ingrained in the DSLR world, who, when I show them an, an electronic viewfinder, go, Wow, I had no idea you could actually play back images through the viewfinder. This is actually a really big deal. So I thought it would be worth mentioning. Um, Doug, I mean, do you do you play? I'm always playing back the images through the viewfinder. Do you do that? Never, <laughs> never. I mean, um, why not? Well, because I have this nice big screen on the back of the camera. Yeah, but you can't see the screen when it's sunny. I don't. You know, I never play back my images. I'm used to really? shooting. Well, I'm used to shooting film so much of the time. So the idea that you might be able to look at what you've just done is a is, is an unknown concept to me. No, that's not true. That's not true. But the fact is that I I don't spend much time looking at the back of my camera. Well, I'm I'm a I'm a, a serial chimper. I do, uh, except I'm going ooh ooh while looking through the viewfinder and magnifying it because it does it does look really nice. And I should say at this point, Canon's fitted um, a, a really nice electronic viewfinder too. It's three point six nine million dot OLED par for the course for a high-end mirrorless camera in 2018. So no better than the competition, but no worse either. It does look really nice. And if you're coming from a 5D Mark IV, you will notice the magnification is a bit bigger. So the image is larger. And I'd encourage you, DSLR people, to have a look at them because electronic viewfinders have moved on a lot, even in the past year or two. And the viewfinders on these latest generations look really nice. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit more about autofocus and sort of general handling before um, moving on. Because it's 100% live view, it, it's using Canon's dual pixel CMOS AF to do all of the autofocusing all of the time. There is no viewfinder AF system that's separate like you'd get on a DSLR. And Canon are boasting that they can now focus at light levels down to minus six EV, which is dimmer than pretty much all of the competition. There, however, there is a caveat with that. You do need to have an f 1.2 lens fitted, which basically means the 50 mil, the new 50 mil, which I'll show you in a sec. If you mount an f 2.8 lens, then it operates down to minus three V, which is still which is still fairly respectable. So you know, in low light, it does work pretty well. 
Um, in terms of continuous autofocus, well, the camera can shoot at eight frames per second. But actually, I'll take this opportunity to let you hear what the shutter sounds like. This is the mechanical shutter. So it's a kind of clacky kachik. Now, if you've got single autofocus enabled on this camera, it will shoot at eight frames per second. But if you're using continuous autofocus, it drops to five frames per second. And I should say that while it does that, it is um, not giving you live feedback between the frames. It's that old electronic trick of showing you the last picture that you saw, which is fine if a subject is coming straight towards you. But if it's zipping from side to side, like, you know, a kind of uh, like a football player, for example, or a bird that's flying through the sky, then it does actually become quite hard to track because when you see the, the subject move, in the viewfinder on the screen. That's a picture you've played back from a split second ago. And in fact, it's now moved on a bit further than you think. So it can be quite hard to track. Now, I found in my test with this uh, camera that it, it gave me almost 100% hit rate in terms of uh, focus when I was uh, shooting my friend Ben cycling towards me and you can see those results at camerlabs.com that is a that's an excellent hit rate but it's at five frames per second with no feedback the the Sony a7 III can do that at 10 frames per second with the same degree of success and if you drop to eight frames per second on the Sony you do get live feedback um, when I tried more kind of random subjects like birds in flight it, it, it was not a success. It, it struggled a lot of the time to get any of them in focus. There was some where you'd go, oh, I think it's got that one. You'd look a bit closer. You're like, no, it hasn't. It was only capable of following, in my test with lenses that I used, fairly modest action, which to me was a bit disappointing. But then Sony's done a fantastic job at persuading us that, in fact, we all care a lot about sports photography and action photography because their technology can do it. So they've made us perhaps think it's more important than it really is for a lot of people. But the fact is that if you are shooting wildlife or sports, I would not recommend the ESR, not yet, because the autofocus and burst shooting and the live feedback just isn't there compared to the competition. Uh, Doug, you're a fairly normal type of guy, apart from when you're talking to me on these things. Do you do? Do you use continuous autofocus at 10 frames per second a lot? Uh, I do a lot, um, and that's one of the things that has confused a lot of people that I work with. Two things. One is, as you say, which is giving you a live image versus a playback, if you will. And the other is so many of the cameras will set their exposure and or focus on the first exposure in a burst, and they won't continuously update the exposure or the autofocus, autofocus in particular. And so a lot of people are confused as to why their bursts are out of focus. Um, my cameras, luckily, I'm shooting mostly with an a Sony A9, which is sort of the king, I think, of uh, the ability to shoot in these uh, high-speed bursts. Yeah, I should say, while we're talking about the A9, another big deal that Sony, uh, Sony, well, that Sony's great at doing these features, saying we're the best at it because they've literally kind of invented it and uh, it, they've made us all think that we want it. Some of these are useful features. For example, eye detection, which is now now works amazingly well on the Sony cameras. The EOS R also now has eye detection, but it doesn't work in continuous autofocus mode, in servo AF mode. You can only use it in single AF mode. So if your subject is kind of rocking back and forth, like, you know, like a, a kid or even an impatient adult will do, then you're going to struggle with that, uh, whereas the Sony just does, does it effortlessly. But even with that in mind, I found that because I, I shot a lot with the EOS R and the, the, um, the A7 III side by side, the a7 III and the a7 R3, when they have, and the a9, when they have a fa uh, face and eye detection enabled, the eye detection is so sticky, it picks it up even when the eye is absolutely tiny on the frame and it follows it everywhere. It's quite hard to lose it. Whereas I found with the EOS R, the eye detection worked literally about 50% of the time. You would literally point it, not just the eye, even the face detection, you'd point it at your face or at someone's face and it'd go, nope, no face there. And you'd be like, you know, there's nothing else in the frame. It might as well just be a person against a plain background. And it was still struggling, you know, not like they were wearing glasses or a hat or anything like that. Just some faces it, it found immediately. Other faces it was like, no, that's not a face. And the eye detection was even less consistent or reliable um, to a point that, in fact, I switched it off and ended up going to position the, the AF area by hand. Again, this is something that they might be able to prove, improve, but this is this is an area where Sony is just way ahead of where Canon are right now. Whether this is important to you or not, well, Doug, is face and eye detection important to you? Uh, I've learned to depend on it. It certainly has substantially increased my yield in terms of percentage of good shots. 
Yeah, and as we're all kind of getting as as very shallow depth of field lenses are coming back into fashion again, your focusing has to be that much more precise. And you know the margin of error, you know, the, you, there's a very strong chance it's going to be out of focus. So any camera that can keep an eye in focus with a very shallow depth of field lens is is going to be great for portraiture if that's the effect that you're after. And again, Sony's great at that. Canon less so um, at the moment. I should also say another feature that Sony keeps saying is a great thing to have is the silent shutter using a fully electronic shutter. Well, Canon has this now, but again, there's a lot of caveats involved in it. For example, it will work with continuous autofocus on the ESR, but not for bursts. So if you have, uh, you know, if you have, say, some wildlife coming towards you or something and you want to be nice and discreet and have the silent shutter you can fire off one frame but you can't fire off more than one frame with uh in in any mode so it's it's for single shot um only it does work with continuous af but only single shot which is a bit disappointing um i should also say that it's got awful rolling shutter so if you are panning at all from side to side or your subject is moving quickly from side to side you are going to see some skewing artifacts they're they're pretty they're pretty obvious on this but then to be fair only really the Sony A9 has managed to avoid that because its sensor has that faster readout. Doug, do you use the silent shutter, the electronic shutter much? Uh, I do quite a bit because I shoot a lot of dance rehearsals and dance performances. So the combination of the burst rate, the silent shutter, um, and the face and eye detection makes for the best camera I've ever used for shooting dance. Cool. So you see, it's, there are there are scenarios in which you can use this. I don't think it is Sony all the time just going, hey, guys, this feature is really important to everyone, you know, and it actually not being. I think there are lots of people who can benefit from these. But now it's time to talk about, you know, the biggest new feature of the ESR, which is a new a new lens mount. So Canon has developed a new lens mount. The kind of quite amusing thing is, is that, you know, they literally went back to the drawing board. They could they could have created anything anything they wanted they like like nikon did they create nikon created a, a very wide uh throat diameter for uh, for their z or z mount canon went away had a long a big long think about it a really hot cup of tea and then concluded that in fact the diameter of the old ef lens mount was perfect why change it? But the flange distance is, of course, smaller. There's no there's no mirror there, so there's the opportunity to get those uh, rear elements of the lens much closer to the sensor. So this is the RF lens mount. And one of the first things you'll notice there, Doug, is look at that. The sensor is not visible. The shutter curtain is closed. Now, you would imagine that this is, this is of course, what you should have on all cameras. But nobody else does this. All of the mirrorless cameras that I know of have their sensor exposed while the uh, the lens is off. You know, anything, you could stick your finger on it. Now, of course, I should say that a shutter does not provide much uh, protection. If you would stick your finger in there, you would break it um, or damage it. But the fact is, is that they're about the only people that do that. What do you think of that feature? I, I think it's brilliant. I don't know why everybody doesn't do that. It makes perfect sense. It's, look, it's better than nothing. It's better than leaving it exposed. Yeah, and the other interesting thing is, is that when you switch off the cameras, the lenses set their uh, focal ratio to f22 or f16, whatever is the smallest aperture, and they also uh, refocus the elements to, I think, to infinity, and they uh, put a warning on the screen which says, don't leave your camera pointing at the sun. So it's like, blimey Canon, all right, mate, yeah, you know fine you know you've closed you've closed the shutter you've closed the aperture you've refocused it you've given me the warning it's like what do they know that the other camera manufacturers don't is or you know is this sensor particularly particularly sensitive anyway uh so we have the same diameter as an ef lens mount but because of the shorter flange that's the distance between the actual mount itself and the sensor because that is much much shorter and because it now has a different communication system there's more pins on that than before you cannot just mount an ef lens on this so there are adapters i'll come to them in just a sec first of all let's talk about those native lenses so canon launched the eos r with four they call them rf lenses four rf lenses i say they launched it with four but actually only two of them are available at the time that i made this video but i have had a chance to play with all four of them so there is as we discussed at the start what will become the kit zoom this is the rf 24 to 105 millimeter f 4 l usm this has uh, image stabilization it is uh, one of only of those four lenses only two of them have got image stabilization because i might as well just come out and say it right now everyone knows it already but we have to discuss it um 
One of the major downsides of the ESO, it does not have built-in sensor shift stabilization. So in that regard, it's different from Nikon, from Sony, from Panasonic, from Olympus, even Fujifilm on the, the X-H1 has built-in stabilization. Canon has gone, no, we don't need that. We don't need to do that. If you want stabilization, build it in the lens because it works brilliantly in the lens. Yes, it does. If you have it built in the lens, but lots of your lenses don't have it built in. So those lenses become unstabilized. And if you drink as much coffee as Doug and I, then you're going to have wobbly footage and wobbly pictures. And even if even if you use a fast shutter speed to avoid camera shake, you know, that doesn't help you when you're filming video. And it also doesn't help you frame your shots if you're using a longer lens. I like to have a, you know, a nice steady image when I compose it. And, you know, I feel that was that is a frustrating omission. So of these, I mean, Doug, how big a deal is that for you? No built-in stabilization. I think it's a big deal, especially because, as you say, two of the four lenses don't have it. But we should also point out that this is sort of typical of the first-generation cameras. As you mentioned, first-generation Sony, first-generation Fuji, or second-generation even, didn't have it. Even in the Micro Four Thirds, you know, it came in a bit later. Mm. So um, it, just show, it, just show, it just shows where we are with this camera. Yeah, I. Do you know what though? I, I don't know. I just can't see. I can't see Canon doing it. I hope I'm proven wrong. I don't think they're. I wouldn't rely on it. I wouldn't think. Do you know what? I'm going to invest in this, knowing that there'll be built-in stabilization in the future. Don't count on it. So the other stabilized lens is a uh, 35 millimeter. Um, f1.8 macro lens so there's only two that have image stabilization in the rf mount the 35 macro and the 24 to 105 f4 now the thing about these new lens mounts is that all the manufacturers say hey you know because we've got this shorter uh, sensor to flange distance we can actually develop these exotic optics but uh, in the case of nikon they, they haven't actually released anything exciting from day one for the uh, Z or Z series. However, Canon, I'm pleased to say, did with the EOS R, with the RF system. So I'm going to show you the first of the exotic lenses. This is the 50mm f1.2. This is a beast of a lens that weighs about one kilogram. And when you mount it on the, on the EOS R, I mean, it becomes a really serious proposition. I've been carrying this around for the past two weeks. And it's a beautiful lens to shoot with. The quality is fantastic. But, you know, this is a, a serious bit of kit. And it, it's worth saying at this point that I think this, this show, shows a lot about Canon's strategy for this camera. Because the camera itself is, is quite large. It is larger than something like a Sony a7 Mark III. In particular, it's taller. And on the grip, when you hold it, your little finger doesn't dangle off the bottom. Or at least mine doesn't. I can hold it with all four fingers. And you need them with lenses like these. But I think this camera is designed for it. This does not feel like an oversized lens whereas a lot of the time when you put on i feel say some of sony's really good quality g master lenses on some of their smaller bodies that it sometimes feels a little bit front heavy in this case you know it feels all right but you know let's compare this lens to the old ef 50 millimeter f 1.2 now to be fair this lens only works when it's this far away from the sensor so you'd still have to you know take that into account but still this lens is way bigger than the old ef 1.2 version i actually did a side-by-side -side test with those two lenses the new rf version is definitely sharper it's sharper in the corners there's less vignetting the geometric distortion is much improved you know it's very very square but in terms of sort of sharpness in the middle or when you stop it down they're very similar but this lens is like twice the weight and twice the price so you know, and, and the other one. Now, this lens is compact and light compared with the other exotic lens uh, in the RF collection. The 28 to 70 millimeter F2. Yes, an F2 full frame zoom. 28 to 70. No one else has got a lens like this. So I'm very excited that Canon has launched this system with, you know, some truly unique optics. Now, I had a chance to use that 28 to 70 and it is a remarkable lens, but it's not optically stabilized. And it's the size of my head almost so i mean it's it's enormous uh, what do you what do you think of those four lenses at launch doug are you excited by them does it instill confidence and enthusiasm in you more so than any other system well i'm, I'm glad you asked gordon i don't know where we're going in the camera industry here is my 50 millimeter lens look at the size of this now admittedly it's an f2 it's a leica sumicron f2 i gotta tell you i bought this lens used for less than you can buy the 50 millimeter f12 on the um, uh, on the new Canon mount, so that's that's one thing to consider. Hey, there's something else though. So, all right, the 28 to 70. Yes, you get an f2 instead of f2.8, which is what other people do, but it's 28 at the wide end, not 24. And yeah. I don't know if you know, given that cameras can shoot at high ISOs. Uh, yes, I understand. There's a little bit 
shallower depth of field if you go to f2 that's great but i wouldn't give up 24 millimeters to go to 28 to get one stop faster now the other thing though is let's look at the prices so i give the prices of all four of these lenses you ready to talk about them all yeah sure yeah let's do that okay so the 50 millimeter is a $2,300 lens here in the US, non-image stabilized, as you said. Also non-image stabilized is this 28 to 70 f2, which comes in at $3,000. It is not a cheap lens by any means. And still, again, no image stabilization, 28 millimeters at the wide end. The 24 to 105, which is the more common kit lens, f4 with image stabilization, $1,100. I think that's sort of the sweet spot. I mean, I would definitely, if I were going with this camera, I would get the kit lens. I think it's a nice, uh, it's a nice point there. Um, but the 35 millimeter f1.8, it's a macro. It is image stabilized, and it's only $500. Tell us about that lens. I'm so curious to know why. Here you have a nice fast prime with stabilization that's so much less expensive than the others. Is it any good? Well, they haven't let us try it yet. I've I've picked it up. I've tried it. I've focused with it. It it works. It's fairly compact compared to the rest of the system, but it's still massive. Um, it's got a different focusing system. I think it's STM instead of USM. Um, but you know, it is image stabilized. No one really. At the time I made this video, we made this video. No one had tested it yet, so it's it's the one that we've not been really able to try yet. But yeah, it does seem to be the affordable option. So at least there is one of those there, but still far off from having a, a nifty fifty except you can mount a nifty 50 because of course canon isn't daft it sold 1 billion ef lenses i made that figure up it's less than that but it's still a lot of ef lenses in the market and of course they'd be mad not to let you adapt those especially since sony does it particularly well with a metabones or a sigma adapter so uh, canon has come back and it said hey look sony here's what we're going to do this is an ef lens adapter in fact in the uk market you get this thrown in with the 24 to 105 kit and an ef adapter but they don't have one ef lens adapter they have three ef lens adapter now to help explain those i'm going to go back to the uh, to the enormous 50 millimeter here and just show you something all rf lenses are focused by wire which you may or may not like but they also all have this customizable ring it's a clicky ring i believe you can de-click it at a service center but it's it's not an insignificant process but you can customize that to do things like the aperture you know like the old days how you used to have an aperture ring on lenses you could also get it to change the iso the exposure compensation things like that it's a customizable thing now here's the cool thing about their adapters so here is an ef lens adapter it's just a plain one there's nothing to it it's completely see-through like that nothing clever about that but the next model up actually has a control ring the customizable control ring so if you've set up your customizable control ring to say do exposure compensation or iso on the esr if you buy the adapter that also has the control ring then suddenly you get that feature on all of your ef lenses that you mount and I think that's quite a nice feature, but there's an even better feature because there are three adapters, not, not one or two. The third adapter doesn't have uh, the ring, sad face, but what it does have is a drop-in filter system and it is available in two versions. You can get one that has a circular polarizer and one that has a variable ND filter. Now, Doug, we were having a quick chat about this before. You're particularly excited about that. Why is that? Well. I have a fair amount of experience using some of the big Nikon lenses like the 200 to 400 f4 and that has a drop-in filter that is spectacular for a number of reasons one is of course the filters are small and very portable the other is if you're using neutral density one of the problems with neutral density is that you want to take it off to focus or compose and then put the thing back on with the drop-in filters that's very very easy to do much easier even than removing a, a rectangular filter from the front of the lens um, I'm, I'm a little nervous about the variable ND because I've used variable NDs and I've seen a lot of artifacts from them. I don't know if putting it behind the lens solves that problem or not. I don't know if you had a chance to play with one, but um, certainly for ND filters, for polarizers, I love having them behind the lens. And of course, it's fantastic if you're filming video because it means that you can use those nice bright apertures, but but keep those shutter speeds nice and motion friendly, you know, in bright conditions. So it's it's really it's a really nice feature to have. The interesting thing is, is that, of course, that 
as a filmmaker would make me want to use EF adapted EF lenses more than native RF lenses because the native RF lenses don't have a drop in variable ND filter, but you know, your ad old adapted EF lenses do. So if I was a filmmaker, I'd think, well, you know, forget those new lenses. I'm going to stick with my old ones because I've got this nice feature. So it's kind of, it's, it's re I'm really pleased that they've used, Canon's used this space because it is empty space between the back of a, you know, a DSLR lens and the mount on the mirrorless camera. It's empty space that they've used it for something useful. Yeah, but, you know, if you're a filmmaker, you're not going to use these four new RF uh, mount lenses anyway because you don't want focus by wire. I think most, at least a serious filmmaker, wants the ability to uh, set, you know, to do focus pulls that are predictable with, you know, manual focus whatever the opposite of focus by wire, focus by gear, I guess, is the answer. Yeah, but, focus, yeah. Yeah, so I think a, a filmmaker who's going to use this camera, if they're a serious filmmaker, they're not going to use these um, focus by wire lenses anyway. I think you're absolutely right. It's a very good point. Now, something that the EOS R can do, which EOS DSLRs cannot do, and this is quite a nice feature, you can also mount EFS lenses onto the adapters and use those. You might think, well, this is quite a high-end full-frame camera. Why would I use crop frame lenses? Well, let me tell you. Now, when you mount an EFS lens via the official Canon adapter, the EOS R enters into a crop mode. And for still photography, it does what you would expect. It acts like a Canon APS-C camera. It reduces the field of view automatically by 1.6 times. Nothing you can do about that. And that in turn takes pictures. I think it's about 12 megapixels is what they work out at. I can't imagine many people doing that. However, for video, it does something quite interesting. It enters into a video crop mode. Now, the video crop mode is actually a different crop to the stills crop. This is very important. Pay attention. So instead of a 1.6 times crop, it's more like a 1.75 to 1.8 times crop. And that will become slightly clear in a minute. This applies to 4K video for 1080p video. Um, the benefit, I guess, being that you can switch between those two formats without a change in the field of view. However, there is there is a, there are a couple of catches. One of those catches is that for some reason in crop movie mode, um, 1080, 50, and 60p become unavailable, and so does 720 at 100 or 120p. They're not available in crop mode. I don't know why. And unfortunately, the camera enters crop mode when you're using an EFS lens. So again, you're thinking, what the hell are you talking about, Gordon? Why would I want to use an EFS lens? Well, let me tell you this. Let's go back to 4K video, because I'm about to now talk about one of the other major disappointments about the ESR. When you film 4K video on this camera, regardless of the lens, so you could fit a full frame lens or an, or an adapted lens or an EFS adapted lens, 4K on this camera always uses a movie crop mode. It always applies that 1.75, 1.8 times field reduction. That's pretty severe. If it sounds familiar, it's because that's how the EOS 5D Mark IV worked. It literally took a one-to-one -one crop from the middle of the sensor and recorded it. Um, obviously, there's no scaling artifacts to worry about, but it's tiny. It multiplies all your lenses effectively by about 1.8 times, which means, you know, suddenly your 24 millimeter is acting at whatever 24 times 1.8 is, which is too much. It's, it's not very wide at all. If only they did some affordable, lightweight, ultra-wide angle lenses with very short focal lengths that didn't need to work outside the APS-C imaging area. Wait a minute. Those are the EFS lenses. So what you can do is mount something like an EFS 10 to 18 millimeter STM, which is a very lightweight, um, cheap, and, and quite a nice lens. And and the and the EOS R will work perfectly well with that in 4K. It will treat it exactly the same as it would treat a full frame lens because it's only using a little bit in the middle of it. And then your 10 millimeter focal length would become, say, 18 millimeter, which is still pretty wide. It's fine for vlogging. Um, in fact, here's an example of how that how that looks. It, it actually works. It works pretty well at 10 millimeter. However, you while you're doing this, you think, yeah, I found a workaround to 4K on the EOS R. But then you think, but why? Why am I trying to find a workaround for this? Because, you know, it's, it's using an area that's smaller than APS-C. I could actually just use a Sony A6300 or an A6500 or a Fujifilm X-T3. And that is used, that will use the full APS-C sensor um, for 4K at a much cheaper price. Or I could get Sony A7 III and uh, shoot full frame 4K or crop frame 4K. Um, you know, it's kind of like you feel you're making excuses for the Canon and looking for solutions, but... You know, it's, 
this is this is this is a bit of a downside but i just want to talk about one other thing in terms of using different lenses this is a really interesting lens this is the sigma 18 to uh, 35 millimeter f 1.8 now this is an aps-c lens it's designed for aps-c sensors however the thing that makes this different from canon's efs lenses is the mount now sigma have not put an efs lens mount on this they put an ef lens mount on it and what that means is that it does not force the EOS R into its crop frame mode. You get to choose when you mount this. It's, it's treating it as if it were a full frame lens. Now, if you put it into its full frame mode, uh, you'll see what happens here. You'll see that you can see the literally the imaging circle. Um, you know, you can see that this lens was not designed to be used full frame. But as you begin to zoom it in, you find that at around 24, 25, 26 millimeter, it's delivering a clean frame with virtually no vignetting in the corners um, but but at f1.8 on a relatively affordable lens. So I did some vlogging tests with this, and I thought the results were actually actually pretty sweet. So again, you know there are ways around this, but there's no getting away from the fact that when you film 4K on the ESR, it's with this enormous crop that doesn't seem to affect other manufacturers. So there's no benefit to that full frame sensor when you're filming 4K, which in 2018 is surely a disappointment, wouldn't you say, Doug? Uh, yeah, I think, um, again, first generation. Where it's going, I don't know, but um, we've got first generation disappointments, let's say. Yeah, now if you look at this, so 4K with a crop, at, you know, at 20, 24 to 30p, 1080 only available up to 60p, so there's no high frame rate 1080 on this only only up to 60p if you want anything higher than 60p you've got to shoot in 720 whereas everyone else in 2018 is offering uh, 100 or 120p at 1080 uh, 1080 quality so this is uh, this is another disappointment it, and it should remind you again of the eos 5d mark 4 because it shared those same video formats you might think wait a minute has canon not moved on at all from the 5d mark 4 well i do want to before we move on to the next bit do say there are some dif there are some differences. First of all, the the 5D Mark IV filmed in motion JPEG, which might have been easy to edit, but it resulted in epically large files. Fortunately, the uh, EOS R films in H.264, uh, so it's much more efficient in terms of a codec. Um, you also get focus peaking, no no zebras. You know, even though they're available on other cameras, no zebras, but at least you do get focus peaking. You didn't get that on the 5D Mark IV. You also, the 5D Mark IV didn't have a log option. Now you do on the ESR, you've got C-Log in 8-bit internally or 10-bit externally. And that is its first feature that it can go, take that Sony, you don't do 10-bit external. I do. And in fact, I was using that on the Atomos Ninja 5 and it works a treat. 10-bit output in 4K very very nice um and in fact if you're coming from the other direction if you're say a canon cinema uh camera owner you know got c300 or whatever they they are then the osr becomes quite a tempting b-roll camera because you can shoot in c-log and and uh, although the, the log isn't exactly the same it's much more similar and much easier to match than say using a, a sony camera as your as your b camera so that is a those are really nice benefits over the eos 5d mark IV, and also having a fully articulated screen that can face you so if you're into vlogging then you know the eos r remarkably is the only full frame mirrorless camera with a fully articulated screen which i, I still find amazing now i i know that the only the only people this bothers uh, is vloggers and they probably represent a very small community but a very loud community because of course we're the people doing the content on youtube so we're going to go i wish it had this no one else cares do you care, Doug? Are you excited about the fully articulated screen? You know, I didn't care about it until today, Gordon, because <laughs> this is the first show that we're shooting uh, with a mirrorless cameras instead of, for me, at least the webcam. And so it matters to me because right now I would love to look at that Sony a6300 and be able to see myself, but I can't because it doesn't have a fully articulating screen. So, yes, I get it finally curse you sony for not having a camera which has a microphone input and an articulated screen that faces forward seems so simple anyway uh what you do get on the canon is of course again the dual pixel cmos cf may be a bit too slow to track birds flying towards you when you're shooting bursts but it is great for video af um you, you can see pulling focus even with an f 1.250 millimeter is completely effortless and face tracking also works very very well on this camera with dual pixel cmos cf and i tried that with the 50 mil the, the new rf 50 mil 1.2 and also the older ef 
50 mil f1.2 and they both tracked faces brilliantly you know in 4k or 1080 just works very very well so uh, that's great before i leave video it has got quite bad rolling shutter so don't swing it around especially in that cropped 4k mode you're gonna see it give a bit of that uh, if you swing it from side to side so try and be gentle with it um doug let's talk about the body because the one thing I thought um, that Canon and Nikon would do, uh, which the other manufacturers wouldn't do, and the the advantage I felt that they would have over everyone else, was in terms of control and ergonomics. What I really wanted to see was kind of very modern electronics, but very old fashioned controls. I, I've kind of realized that I am a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to controls, but they haven't done that. Um, with the EOS R, we, we don't have a mode dial, we have a mode button. Uh, we don't have an AF joystick. Instead, all of the autofocusing is done by tapping the touchscreen. You can use it as a touchpad AF through the viewfinder, but it is all done with the touchscreen. Um, no AF joystick. It's got this strange kind of touchpad that, where you kind of sort of swipe your finger from left to right. There's no feedback on it at all. Um, it's kind of quite a curious control. I mean, the, the, there is no control wheel on the back like you get on, on higher-end EOS cameras. I feel that Canon solved all of these problems. And I look at the 5D Mark IV and I think, I love the controls on the 5D IV. If only they could have put them on this. Doug, am I being very old-fashioned? Uh, no. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the you know, to me, to my mind, the, the Canon DSLRs have too many buttons. Um, especially coming from Nikon. Nikon has almost the same number, perhaps, but it was... It was frustrating, but you're right. I mean, I would go um, crazy. I, I really would miss the uh, the uh, the focus wheel. What do you call it? The um, the joystick. I'm yeah. so I'm so used to focusing by joystick, especially on my A9. Uh, I would miss that quite a bit. The other thing is that it's all very well having you know this this customized and everything's customizable. All the control buttons. It's all very well having this uh, touch control by the viewfinder. The, the new M fun touchpad and all very well touching tapping to pull focus and everyone knows if you follow camera labs you know that i love touch screens but not instead of it's as well as and you know as soon as conditions get cold and you wear gloves then suddenly these touch screens and touch controls don't work very well or don't work at all which again kind of rules it out for some more kind of extreme environments so do bear that in mind okay i'm gonna um move on to another downside of the the ESR. If I uh, open up here, it has not two, but one card slot. One card slot. It's an SD slot. They've uh, Nikon also has one card slot on the uh, ZZ series mirrorless cameras, but it's XQD. Pros and cons, XQD is supposed to be more robust, faster, although I don't think Nikon exploit the speed of it much, uh, but they are expensive. SD, we've all got them. They're affordable, but, you know, they are vulnerable and one card is vulnerable. Now, I want to ask you, Doug, have you ever had an SD card failure? Uh, I have. I had one fall apart and I actually had a failure about a week ago. And I was just, just coincidentally, I was recording to two cards. Just, I don't normally do it, but I was very, very lucky and all my images were on the second card. So I'm, I'm a believer of that too now. I have had SD cards fall apart as well, but not while I was using them. Um, you know, my photography is so hard. My ca my card fell apart while I was taking pictures. It, I've had them like, say, if I've been transporting them a bit carelessly and they've got a bit, you know, have been flexed a little bit and they've with the case, wherever they were. So they've been damaged that way. I've not lost any images. I've lost some from some compact flash cards back in the day, but not on any SD that I can recall. It's a tough one, you know, and this is something you have to weigh up yourself. Um, only you know, if you, you know, if you're shooting one-off events like weddings or, you know, rocket launches, uh, sports games, you know, things where you can't say, hey, can you score that goal again? Can you launch that rocket again? You know, th for these things, you, you know, redundancy is very important. Backup is very important. Um, so that said, personally speaking, I very rarely fit two cards. I shoot with a lot of cameras that have twin card slots and I very rarely put two in at the same time. Doug, you obviously had a situation where that did work for you. Do you think this really is a deal breaker for as many people as, as we think, or do you think it's only going to affect like pro event shooters? I, I think it's, it's a limited thing because I think most people like you, even if they have a dual slot camera are probably recording to only one card anyway. Um, it's very nice for being able to copy a card in camera if, if the camera supports that. But you're right, it's not one of the more important features to me. Just 
I, I, have, I happen to have been able to use it a week ago. Yeah, I, I think the other thing worth mentioning is that it's very important with new technology to see whether you can actually use your products in different ways to how you used to. If you want to get the most out of a new thing, whether it's a laptop, TV, you know, a camera, don't try and use it the same as your old gear all the time. Adopt the new features. I was very resistant uh, to get another Apple uh, MacBook, for example, when they moved to USB-C completely. But now I've been using one for a couple of weeks and it's like, why didn't I do this sooner? Because it's faster, it's blah, blah, blah. It works so much better than the built-in SD slot. And it's, just, you know, start thinking differently. And if you think differently about the cameras, one thing you can do is you have wireless connectivity in these things. And Canon, the app does let you maintain, if you want a Wi-Fi connection with the camera and transfer every picture you take in the original resolution, not the raw file, just the JPEG, but it can actually transfer that file straight to your phone immediately after you take it. And you don't need to do anything to do that. The Nikon cameras are even do it more easily, but slowly over Bluetooth using SnapBridge. So, you know, you might only have one card slot, but you may, you could configure the camera to actually transfer those images wirelessly to your phone as you shoot and of course you could transfer them to a folder that's then backed up to the cloud in some way and that is actually more secure than relying on the card so that you know now in the canon solution i did try and shoot like that and it's it's not that practical because it does have to leave the wi-fi on all the time um and of course that signal might drop it might not back up all of them but there are alternatives you know don't always think i need two card slots there could be alternatives that could work for you and that that was something that i did try um here's another gotcha uh, if you open up the the flaps you'll see that hdmi port that, that gives 10 bit out Nice, nice, nice. And there's also a USB-C port on this. Now, this uh, this port can be used for charging. However, Canon say, but you have to use our USB-C charger, which costs $200. You can't use your USB-C charger. And I thought, really? Is that true? You know, it's you, you can't say it's got USB charging and then say you can't use a USB charger with it. So I only have one USB charger. And uh, this, the nice seg from before when I said I've, I've got a new MacBook Pro is it comes with a USB-C charger, obviously. So I thought, you know, well, let's plug it in and see what happens. So this is the one for the 13-inch uh, 2018 touchpad uh, MacBook Pro. I think it's 61 watt or something, which is a lot for a camera. Um, but surely USB-C is clever enough to auto-negotiate what it needs. And guess what it did? I plugged in, I plugged it into the ESR and it started charging absolutely fine. And uh, you can see the little battery icon appear on the top screen, which is quite neat. It doesn't tell you how far through it is. Um, it took about two hours to fully charge from zero to 100 using that charger. But when it's finished, it says full on that screen on the top. So I successfully charged the ESR with my Apple MacBook um, Pro charger and the standard Apple cable. And then out of curiosity, I thought, well, I wonder if I could charge it using the actual laptop battery itself. So I unplugged the laptop from the mains power and used the USB-C cable that came with it to just connect the, the laptop directly to the camera. And it also charged it. So I had, you know, two wins there. And I, I really like the idea of being able to use the same charger for my laptop and my camera. I would definitely use that feature. However, I have heard anecdotally a lot of people complaining that other USB-C chargers do not work. So, you know, have a look on the internet and see what people are saying. But certainly my 13-inch MacBook Pro charger did work fine. So um, that's, uh, that's good news. So I think at this point, Doug, because... I don't want to make this show the longest show in the world. I just wanted to sort of talk about some of the some of the interesting aspects of this camera. If you're after a very quick kind of overview that goes over all the features, have a look at my first looks video, uh, which is on YouTube. If you're after an exhaustive review that covers absolutely everything, I've done that at CameraLabs.com, so have a look at that. This video is more about Doug and I kind of discussing the, the features, and I feel that we've gone over most of the uh, pros and cons that make it different from the competition. So... Doug, what are you what are you feeling so far about the ESR? Well, I think we have to always ask the question: Who is this for? Who would buy this camera? Uh, I think if you're not already in the Canon camp, if you don't have a Canon DSLR, uh, this probably isn't the place for you to get started in Canon. But if you do have Canon cameras, uh, I like some of the adapters. As I mentioned, I love that drop-in filter adapter. I can see this would be terrific to use with EFS lenses for video if you want to shoot uh, with that. Uh, th that sort of video crop that you talked about. Um, I love shooting with the 10 to 18. I think that's a great option. Um, that's a that's a nice lens and very inexpensive. It was 10 to 18, right? Isn't that the Canon? Yeah, that's right. And I should at this point also mention that um, 
I adapted the EF 70 to 200 millimeter f 2.8 um, L lens, the Mark III, the latest version, onto the ESR when I was doing my my tests of Ben cycling towards me and also the uh, Seagull, uh, you know, the birds in flight tests. And I also took the opportunity to mount that lens via a Sigma adapter onto the Sony a7 III because, of course, the Sonys do autofocus Canon EF lenses. And I wanted to see which one delivered the better experience. And, you know, the short answer is that the Canon did quite measurably so. It was faster. It was a lot more confident. And it also worked in continuous autofocus, whereas I found that the Sony was surprisingly fast. I'm still amazed that it works at all. But as soon as I started to try and do continuous autofocus with birth shooting, it didn't work very well at all on the adapted Sony body, whereas it worked on the Canon slowly, but it did work. So I would completely agree with you and say that if if what you are looking for is a Canon mirrorless camera that gives you the best experience with adapted EF lenses, then the EOS R is for you. But you have to say, what else is this giving me? If you have a 5D Mark IV, I think it's actually a bit of a step backwards because sure, it's got the same sensor and it has some better movie features, but you're losing twin card slots. You're using the losing the optical viewfinder, which is more confident and can be used for things like birds in flight. Um, you're losing those traditional controls, which, you know, it's personal taste, but I much prefer those. I think it's maybe more for maybe like say an EOS 80D owner, someone who who is coming maybe from their, uh, their APS-C line. So they do have some EFS lenses. They can work on this body, but they are getting the upgrade to full frame while also having the move to mirrorless and the various benefits that that has. But there's no doubt at all that when you compare the EOS R to cameras like say the Sony a7 III, it just comes up short in so many regards. The lack of built-in stabilization, that 4K crop, slow continuous auto-focusing, not particularly confident eye detection. It's it's a difficult camera to recommend overall to anybody unless they are already within the Canon system. But that said, having been shooting with it solidly for two weeks now, it has slowly grown on me and I, I have been fond of the output from it. But again, I think it's really for, uh, for Canon shooters. Yeah. On the other hand, I think as you said in one of your earlier reviews of the camera, um, it's very exciting to finally see Canon really in the mirrorless game. Uh, they've dabbled with it, uh, but this is a this is a serious camera in the mirrorless game, and I love the fact that they're there, and we can expect improvements over the next couple of years. I think that's the most important thing here. Yeah, definitely. This is their first product, uh, but it, it's I think it's quite a bold first step. They've tried some things that are new. They're a bit old fashioned in some respects compared to the competition, but it's it's not a I'd say it's not a version one camera, it's a version two camera. So they've gone in, you know, they've landed uh, with their feet running. But unfortunately, people like Sony are already on their version three cameras. So, you know, they're, they're that step ahead. But again, if you're in that Canon system already, it is it is definitely an, an option. And remember, you invest in lenses. Bodies change over the years, but you generally keep those lenses. And they've done a really great job on those new RF lenses. There's something completely different there. The ones that I've tested so far, they may be large and heavy and expensive, but they are really good quality. So I'm particularly excited about the RF lens, man, and where Canon takes that, and also whether the next body is going to be a higher or a lower end one. I'm interested to see where they take that line. Well, I think we've done a really thorough job here of covering the Canon EOS R or the EOS R. Uh, Gordon, I want to thank you for this time. I want to thank everybody for listening and encourage you that if you are like our podcast, go to YouTube and like us there, uh, subscribe to the podcast anywhere you can find us. Uh, you can always go to camberlabs.com and you can find Gordon's full-length written review as well as his sort of quick take first look. Um, and also look behind Gordon's right shoulder there. You'll see a marvelous book called In Camera. If you're interested in shooting JPEG straight out of camera with phenomenal quality, get a hold of that book. It's really nice. And you can always go to camberlabs.com and buy us a cup of coffee. We're sort of desperate for that. That's what keeps us alive. We have a link for that directly below the video as well. So if you like what we've been talking about and found it useful, then you can treat us both to it. And I do occasionally go to San Francisco and call up Doug and buy him a coffee. Sometimes he does the same in return. As we did. I still owe, I still need to make a trip to Brighton, don't I? Do that. Okay. It would be great to see you. Uh, <laughs> Gordon, thanks very much. I uh, hope everyone will come back and see us once again on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Bye-bye.